Hello, everyone. You are listening to a special podcast episode of The Lobster, made in collaboration between myself, Bill and Wade Roskans Idris, and the Dalhousie Journal of Legal Studies. The interview you are about to hear was conducted with Professor Archibald Kaiser in 2016. In it, we discuss many aspects of mental health and the law. The interview was conducted by myself and two students now off to their professional lives, Jane Lawyer and Lauren Mills Taylor. Professor Kaiser has taught at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University since 1979, is widely recognized as an expert within the intersection of mental health and the law, is cross-appointed with the Faculty of Medicine, and is just generally a really nice and insightful person. We began the interview by asking about the relationship between mental health, mental illness, and the law, and to clear up some of the conceptual confusion that often enters into discussions in this area. I, I think it's probably good to start off with some foundational concepts before we, we go too far. Um, so I, I, it might be useful to remind myself and, and, and the listeners about what we mean when we talk about mental health issues, uh, because too often people conflate mental health and mental illness. You know, there is a relationship, obviously, uh, but you know, we need to think about the ideal state for all of us, which, which is to, to uh, live in a, a state where we, our mental health is you know, preserved and promoted. So when we think about mental health, before we think about mental illness, we think about, and this is a, a definition from the World Health Organization, it's a state of well-being where an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and is able to make uh, contribution to his or her community, and it's not just the absence of a mental disorder. So in a way, we're thinking uh, in a positive sense when we discuss mental health uh, about our ability to participate and enjoy uh, our lives in a fully functioning way. And you know that's actually uh, a concept that has many challenging aspects to it because there are individual attributes you know that we think about. Uh, for each of us that, that engage us in, in considering mental health. You know, the, here's a, a list from an Australian source, for example, where I, th I think they may resonate for all of us, indicators of good mental health on an individual basis. You're said to be mentally healthy when you show resiliency to stress, when you feel a sense of belonging, when you think clearly, uh, when you engage in productive behavior, um, when uh, you demonstrate the ability to take care of yourself and others, when you have a sense of well-being and contentment, when you're flexible, some would say when you have some kind of spirituality, um, when you show a sense of optimism, when you display self-confidence, respect for yourself and others, when you have stable relationships, and when you are able to show empathy. You know, that's not uh, an exhaustive list, but those attributes, I think, if we have them all all the time, we're very fortunate uh, because it, it demonstrates that you know, we are mentally healthy, high-functioning uh, individuals. So those are individual attributes that we think about when we look at mental health. And then you know, it doesn't stop there, and this is where it becomes more complicated because none of us have uh, a mentally healthy state just because of what we are as an individual person. It all connects to the environments in which we, we live, you know, so that there are wider determinants of mental health that we should think about as well, that probably um, we take for granted in many instances, uh, but which underpin our mental health. Uh, so, for example, I tell my students about the need to have social connections, um, you know, which make you feel valued and, and acknowledged, which are satisfying and, and involve formal and informal networks and involve love and intimacy and connection with others. We need to feel that we're free from discrimination um, and free from fear because it's hard to be mentally healthy you know, if you live in an environment you know, where you are insecure in any sense, where you're psychologically in, uh, insecure, where you're emotionally or physically insecure because of what's going on around you, or where the environment is unstable. Um, where you feel that your autonomy is going to be regularly violated because of your social situation. Um, and we also need to, in order to help preserve our individual mental health, we also need to have a, a sense of having uh, access to the world at large, to be able to participate, uh, you know, to have those kinds of opportunities in the work environment, uh, in the educational context, 
having enough income to meet our needs, and having a sense of purpose or meaning. All of these things help underpin our individual mental health. Um, so that, you know, that's where we'd all like to be. Um, and you are asking about uh, mental illness, which, you know, is um, uh, something that we need to reflect upon, which is connected, to, you know, to our mental health. But you can see how mental health is kind of a higher aspiration in some ways, because that means uh, that uh, not only do we not have a mental disorder, but we have, you know, the conditions that permit us to flourish and so all these attributes of, of positive mental health. So. There we have two basic concepts, the notion of mental health and the notion of mental disorder. And what you asked me about, you know, was, well, what does the legal system do about mental health and mental disorder? And in one sense, the answer is very quick. The, the legal system does very little to promote our mental health actively. Um, it, its historic role, unfortunately, has been to coerce people in various domains and to deprive them of their autonomy both in the criminal and, and the civil system. That's been the history of the relationship of uh, the law you know, to our mental states. It hasn't done very much ever to promote mental health. Now, many people talk about you know, there being a new wave of thinking about you know, legislation uh, that might actively promote those individual and, and kind of broader states uh, of uh, uh, being consistent with individual mental health that I talked about. Um, but that's a different vision than, than we've lived with. I mean, that, that's been, I think, promoted in the world community by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which, you know, really is a 21st century international human rights treaty that represents a shift in the world's thinking, away from being concerned about individual pathologization, um, and towards thinking about the obligation to help people uh, find ways to prosper in the community, to prosper in the sense that they feel included. We then asked Professor Kaiser to talk about some examples of when the law fails to properly account for mental health and mental disability. And as it happens, I just gave my students this afternoon, you know, a list of statutes here in Nova Scotia that deal with the mental disability law area. They are all statutes which, or for the most part, statutes which um, would one way or the other permit an intervention based upon a determination that the person is incapable uh, or dangerous. Mm. And uh, that emerges from um, historic notions uh, that probably are a thousand years old now, that the state has a duty under its parents' patriae power okay. sometimes to step in and take over, you know, aspects of a person's life to protect them, you know, when they are impaired. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of it is the state has a duty at times, you know, to intervene to protect society because somebody is dangerous. So those are the kind of historic notions that have given rise to the kinds of legislation that I mentioned I was talking to my students about today. So for example, here in Nova Scotia, we have the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act. Most states have similar legislation. It permits uh, involuntary assessment um, and uh, hospitalization and treatment in certain specified circumstances. In Nova Scotia, we have the Adult Protection Act, which uh, again is an intervention you know, st statute uh, with paternalistic origins for vulnerable adults, let's say, um, who are in need of protection. There is the anachronistic and, and I think um, cruel Incompetent Persons Act, which mm -hmm. emerges from the 18th century, basically, and which says that uh, the Supreme Court can appoint guardians over the estate and persons of incompetent persons. And it says, and no clinician uses this language now, and, and no judge would use it other than having to, by reference to this legislation, Save the because sure. <laughs> it says you know, th th that an incompetent person is a person incapable from infirmity of mind of managing his or her own affairs. Well, I said no judge, clinician, uh, or other person who's thoughtful about this would talk about incompetent persons. Now we would talk about people who don't have the capacity to make a certain decision because of a, an impairment that relates to the, the functional nature of that decision, which 
temporarily uh, or perhaps in the longer term deprives them of the ability to make that decision. So, mm -hmm. but this Incompetent Persons Act has, has kind of a total view. You're either fully competent, you know, mm -hmm. analogous to the fully mentally healthy person, or you're incompetent and you have no ability to make in, any decisions. Intrigued by this language of competence and incompetence, Jane Lawyer then jumped in to ask Professor Kaiser about the importance of language and labels when we talk about mental health and disorder. It seems like a lot of our discussion today is talking about the languages the Act uses and the language we dis use to discuss mental yes. health with the law specifically. I was wondering if you could just clarify for our listeners today the approach we should be taking and the types of languages we should be using to be more in line with the UN Convention and to be more when we're speaking about mental health issues in the law, to be more supportive to this new dichotomy rather than reinforcing kind of this old stigma through the old law? Well, I do think that the issue of language and labeling is critical uh, because, uh, you know, where we wouldn't um, refer to other marginalized groups using, you know, the, the ancient labels that are so devaluing of people with respect to persons with mental health difficulties, you still see in the press and you probably hear in, in you know, discourse with, with others, you, you probably still hear people talked about as being mental patients or schizophrenic or mentally ill or retarded or suffering from or being insane. Um, you know, these are all labels which are now properly rejected where basically it's, it's not a matter of you know, what is often a discredited thing, you know, being politically correct. It, 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 because that's used by the right wing, you know, to, to uh, attack attempts to be respectful towards others. Um, so that you're not just being politically incorrect when you use those kinds of labels, you're verbally abusing people and it shouldn't be permitted. So if you want to think about how to use language in a manner that's consistent with fundamental human rights concepts, um, then we recognize that labels have a, an effect on the way other people treat us and maybe the way we think about ourselves and we have to think about people respectfully. So the modern you know, outlook would be to use pr uh, people first language, basically to say uh, that you're not characterized just by your illness. You know, if you had cancer, we don't say you cancer patient, <laughs> you know, or you cancerer. You know, we, we don't we don't use language like that. It would be unthinkable. You know, we say you're a person you know who has a cancer diagnosis. Let's say, mm -hmm. well, it's no different here. You would talk about it in a more respectful way. Uh, the use of nomenclature, which doesn't discharacterize somebody by their disability, but talks about them as a person first and as somebody with many different characteristics. So there are lots of good, you know, respectful language guidelines out there now, um, you know, that are, are promulgated by bar associations or by disabled rights advocacy associations, m many. But the, the common feature is uh, that there's no single, you know, label that's appropriate. The important thing is to make uh, a serious effort to use people first language. So, you know, you would perhaps say that you would talk about people with disabilities as opposed to the handicapped or the disabled. Mm -hmm. Or you might say, as one language guide I have here now, uh, you might talk about somebody who has a cognitive disability or diagnosis rather than saying he's mentally retarded. Or um, say that a person has an autism diagnosis rather than she's autistic. Um, or he has a diagnosis of Down syndrome rather than he's Downs. Um, or uh, that um, the person has a mental health diagnosis rather than he or she is mentally disturbed or mentally ill. Um, or a person has a brain injury as opposed to he's brain damaged. Um, or a person um, has, for example, a, uh, a mobility impairment. And you might say that person uses a wheelchair. Um, as opposed to saying she's confined, you know, to a wheelchair or she's wheelchair bound. You can see the difference in uh, the tone of each of those ways of referring to people. That if you were the subject of one of those labels, one would make you think, well, if they're talking about me as a person who has a certain diagnosis, let's say, or a certain attribute, well, that's right. You know, that, that's just who I am. But to describe me instead as a mental patient um, or describe me as somebody who's retarded, that language is 
hurtful and disrespectful. Um, and so I'm glad you raised the issue of language. And as I'm talking here with a group of lawyers in becoming, I, I think it, it's especially significant you know, for people who are going to work in the legal system uh, to make sure uh, that they kind of check with the subjects on whose behalf they're ar arguing or about whose fates they're, you know, they're uh, uh, you know, deliberating upon as a judge or a crown attorney, it's important to do a check. Well, what kind of language is best? It may be obvious in many instances. In other cases, it may be best to ask the person. Mm -hmm. you know, how, what a to novel make, thought. To make sure yeah. that, that, that I'm, you know, I'm thinking about you and describing you in the right way. When I discuss this issue in court, What's the best way of, uh, of uh, um, providing a respectful label for you? So language is very important. Um, you know, when language is used to stigmatize, it doesn't just hurt us in an emotional sense. It also may direct our legal fates in ways that, yes. you know, that, that may be very, very harmful. You know, so I mentioned the Incompetent Persons Act earlier. What's in contest there is whether the judge thinks that I'm to receive the label of incompetent person with all the diminution in my legal capacities that that uh, contains with respect to my ability to look after my own fiscal affairs, my ability to look after my own day-to-day -day, uh, uh, decisions. So the issue of labeling is not tangential. It, it, it's not you know, uh, you know, something that uh, we uh, can afford to ignore at all. Mm -hmm. So thank you for raising that. Now, Shifting to a bit of a different focus, when we talk about the law, we talk about kind of the civil versus the criminal context. Yes. And when we think about mental health issues in the criminal context, one of the first things that comes to mind to most people is, oh, like people who are not criminally responsible due yes. to mental disorder. I was wondering if you could shed some light on some other issues of mental health issues within the criminal context, specifically maybe dealing with persons who are incarcerated or dealing with how the police interact with people who might have some mental health issues. Well, too often, and I've been guilty of this at least in part in, in law school teaching, too often we talk about only the not criminally responsible verdict mm -hmm. and, and yes. uh, um, the aftermath of that, which is being subject to the dispositional provisions of the criminal code. Um, but although those are very important issues, mm -hmm. you know, what happens with a person who has a serious mental illness who comes into conflict with the justice system, uh, you know, they should be protected from a verdict of guilty, regular sentencing, um, and uh, they should receive the benefit of an alternative uh, stream, which is what our modern mental disorder um, provisions of the criminal code provide. Although that is an important part of the law, it's actually uh, uh, claimed as a defense by a tiny proportion of criminal accused in Canada. 0.001%, I think I saw as a recent statistic. So the issue that you've raised um, engages us in thinking more broadly about what people talk about in general, this, which is the criminalization of mental illness. And then there are many subsets to that. Yes. But what we mean overall there is where a criminal justice response to behavior that's associated with mental illness is utilized rather than a community services type alternative or a medical alternative in the appropriate circumstances. So that criminalization then uh, occurs when the force of the criminal law is used where other alternatives pursued earlier might have ensured that the person didn't go into crisis, didn't have a conflict with the justice system, um, and um, once there is you know, a uh, conflict with the justice system, criminalization also implies that um, you know, there will be uh, uh, unfortunate sequelae to that. The, the justice system is based upon um, a judgment of guilt or innocence, uh, and then notions of uh, providing penalties that will change behavior that are based upon individual and general deterrence and incapacitation uh, and, and all those general messages of the criminal law which are quite unsuitable for people with serious mental illness often. So you're quite right to think about you know, the subsets of criminalization. There is an overrepresentation of people with mental illness in the justice system. Um, the elements that you alluded to, which include policing and corrections, for example, are, are huge problems uh, where people uh, are processed through a system 
where the result is that they're often treated insensitively and disrespectfully uh, and without acknowledging their particular needs. And the results, of course, can be horrendous. Everything from police officers at worst shooting and killing, you know, persons with mental illness in settings where you know, had there been greater thought um, put to how to approach a person, how to de-escalate a situation that may never have occurred, to prisons where people with mental illness, you know, may be more likely to be subject, you know, to uh, 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 engage in what seems to be defiant behavior, but which is connected to their mental health difficulty, which results in uh, additional prison-related sanctions, it might result in segregation, uh, you know, for them, which would help help them not in the least, and which would encourage deterioration, if anything. Uh, so, you know, the um, process and manifestation of criminalization uh, is one where basically we're, we're not treating people with mental illness who come into contact with the justice system in a manner which optimizes their likelihood of recovery um, and uh, which reduces to a minimum their risk of recidivism. Um, so there are lots of things that can be done. That's the subject of you know my class this afternoon with Tricia here, you know, to help uh, you know change these dynamics. Um, but they're very complicated uh, problems, which have so many hard to attack root causes that it can't be done overnight. But you can certainly think of some of the things that might cause this process of criminalization. Um, homelessness, unemployment, poverty, lack of understanding by criminal justice professionals, um, public attitudes that stigmatize people uh, in ways uh, that you know, attach harmful labels to them. Um, the double stigma that comes with having a mental illness and criminality or as some people say, the triple stigma that comes with mental illness, criminality, and then be put into the forensic justice system, you know, as a result of being found not criminally responsible. Um, but we talked about initially the civil domain and, you know, the interaction of the law with people uh, with mental health difficulties and disabilities there. And you've opened this second giant wound, you know, <laughs> in the way people are treated of, of uh, the criminal justice system, and then we also have to see the interactions because often people, you know, are affected by both systems. You know, they have difficulties in their daily functioning, which may result in their hospitalization. But you know, they're either their untreated mental illness or their lack of finding a place to live in the community results uh, in their going into crisis and and coming into conflict with the justice system. Um, so historically. You know, there's been a, a kind of um, harmfully symbiotic relationship, let's say, between the civil uh, law system, the criminal law system, um, when it comes to people with mental health problems, and they've been bounced back and forth, and they haven't been treated uh, in a way that, you know, kind of fosters their inclusion and, and uh, um, maximizes their opportunities of flourishing in either domain. So... There's a whole subset of issues we can mm -hmm. talk about with respect to the, the criminal justice system and the harsh, ineffective, insensitive, disrespectful ways it treats people. With Nearing the end of the interview, I asked Professor Kaiser to address how neuroscience might help or very possibly hinder the project of correcting the justice system to properly account for those with mental disorders. Um, yeah, well, we're, we only have time for a few more questions, but... Uh, I would just like to dig into one little thing here. So I come from a neuroscience background. I've worked in several labs, uh, and that's what my undergrad that's is in. Not necessarily an impediment to your understanding these issues. <laughs> well, that's actually that's actually what I was wondering. So with a lot of my education, it comes from a very biological perspective yes. on what mental health and what mental illness is. Yes. Uh, however, what we've been talking about a lot so far seems to rely heavily on behavioral as well as relational concepts of mental health and mental illness. Uh, do you think it would be useful or perhaps less, or perhaps uh, detrimental to the legal system to import more of these biological definitions of mental health, uh, whether in terms of what evidence is allowed or how we actually classify mental health and mental illness within legislation, okay. held within the law? 
Well, I'm glad you've raised this issue. I mean, certainly uh, the uh, uh, psychiatric profession has largely gravitated towards a biomedical approach. Absolutely. Uh, towards understanding mental illness and providing treatment. Um, and, you know, in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, the, the newly emerged, you know, psychiatric Bible, so-called, uh, you know, there has been, you know, some greater tendency there, you know, to either lean towards or aspire towards, you know, some kind of biological markers of mental illness. Absolutely. So far, you know, this has been, in my view, a fool's errand, you know, th that, uh, um, you know, there is no blood test or other reliable test now, you know, for specific mental illness diagnoses. Um, I'm not saying there never will be, but on the other hand, uh, uh, yes, I have emphasized social and relational issues because I think they're far more significant uh, in trying to um, get a grip on how to treat people in society and how to ensure their functioning and participation. Uh, and right now, I would say, now maybe if you interviewed me, if I were still alive a hundred years <laughs> from now, I might say something different, but right now, I am very mistrustful of the, the reliability of the contributions of, for example, neuroimaging Absolutely. You know, to our understanding of uh, mental illness and to our ability to find the best ways to treat people within the community. Finally, we asked Professor Kaiser to address the importance of thinking about mental health within legal education and the legal profession. Well, it's a good question and an appropriate one to, to finish on. You know, if we're talking about the audience that I have here today in a law school uh, environment, I, I, the, the, um, the tragedy is that in the past, uh, the legal profession has failed to recognize the stressors that it creates for students and practitioners and judges. Um, and people's mental health has uh, deteriorated very often as a result of that. Um, my colleagues, your peers, um, you know, have uh, abused substances to try to self-medicate, you know, to assist them in coping with their stress or their sadness or their feelings of loss or, you know, or, or loss of direction, loss of purpose, you know, excess materialism. They've, they've done all sorts of things which are self-harming. And until recently, you know, law schools and the legal profession have been quite unsympathetic and unreceptive. In the past 10 years, approximately, I think there's been a heightened recognition uh, that the legal profession is at times a very unwell profession, uh, and uh, that rather than simply sweeping that under the carpet, we should try to be proactive, recognize what causes people to deteriorate, um, and we should be supportive rather than just waiting till they can no longer practice or waiting till they collapse in the midst of an exam. We should try to accommodate them in advance to ensure that as much as possible they can get on with their lives. Um, but we should recognize that when they are unable to, that you know, once more the appropriate response is to support them rather than to kind of stigmatize them and isolate them and, and, and so on. So I think it's only laterally that we're making progress as a profession, and I'm thinking both of being a lawyer and being a law professor, as a, as a profession in recognizing that uh, uh, promoting mental health should be a vital part of the law school enterprise and the legal profession and recognizing when people have mental health problems and supporting them you know, needs to be the other side of it. Um, uh, so things may be slowly getting better and the bar into which all of you very young people are emerging um, might be a lot uh, healthier overall and certainly less stigmatizing and more supportive. I can't forget that it's only approximately five years or so ago that in Nova Scotia, the articling questionnaire you know, asked applicants, well, have you ever consulted with a mental health professional in your life? And if so, tell us all about it. Oh boy. With the assumption at that time being, well, if you ever consulted with a mental health professional at any time, there's something wrong with you that should make us mistrust you. Mm -hmm. 
Now the bar has eliminated that question. I don't know that it's been eliminated in all provinces, but certainly in Nova Scotia, we've left that dark era behind, and we recognize that, gee, if you had a mental health problem and you consulted somebody and you got some supports, that probably shows a high level of self-awareness, and it probably means that you know, you're more able to function in a stressful world, and that's a good thing rather mm -hmm. than something that should discredit you. But that's just one example, and we could find many more you know, of the insensitivity of at times law schools and the legal profession. So I think we're getting somewhat better at that, but uh, I do believe we have a long way to go as a profession and then of course beyond that as a legal system. Well, let's hope that things like Wellness Week can be the thin edge of the wedge uh, in those terms. Well, thank you very much for joining us uh, to bring a little bit of light and to bring a little bit of conversation uh, to this often, well, ignored and silenced area within the law. Thank you very much. Glad to meet all of you, and uh, uh, thanks for your penetrating questions. Well, that's it, everyone. We hope you have enjoyed this interview. I believe it's more important than ever to have a frank and open conversation about mental health in the law and the legal profession. This podcast episode was produced in partnership with the Dalhousie Journal of Legal Studies. We want to offer special thanks to Matt McClellan and Alexandra Terrell for their helpful commentary. If you have any questions or concerns about what you heard in this interview, please feel free to contact myself at dylan.roskamsidris, that's d-y-l-a-n dot r-o-s-k-a-m-s hyphen e-d-r-i-s at dal dot c-a. The Dalhousie Journal of Legal Studies and I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of The Lobster, your place for legal analysis in a pinch.